warm welcome to the launch event of our publication, The Indigenous World 2023. We are thrilled to have all of you here with us today to celebrate the release of this year edition. I would like to extend a sincere thank to all our panelists for being here with us today. We know that they are all very, very busy and we appreciate very much their commitment to joining us for the launching of the Indigenous World today. Thank you again for your time and your support. This is the 37th edition of the Indigenous World. And since the establishment of, or since the first session of the UN Permanent Forum in 2002, we have been launching here during the annual session of the UN Permanent Forum. I won't go into the content of the book or the highlights of the book this year, as my dear colleague and the IPS director, Catherine Bessendorf, will do it in her presentation later. As we do not have much time, and most of our speakers, they have other commitments, I am pleased to introduce Martin Biele Hermann, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Denmark to the United Nations for some opening remarks. Martin, welcome, and uh, we are always very honored and pleased to have you with us. And I really thank you for taking a little bit of your time to be with us. Please, Martin. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Lola, for having me. I was connecting with a friend from Indonesia, not from Toraja, no? so what's the story? Uh, okay, let, let me just put on my reading glasses so I get this right. So, <laughs> I get distracted. Sorry, Lola. No. <laughs> well, th thank you, Lola. He's the one who has to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, Lola, so much for both for the opening remarks, but also for the introduction, but most of all for, for the invitation to be here. And I really want to start by acknowledging the work that has gone into this year's uh, government forum. Now, I think, you know, the UN Charter with the words we the peoples and, and I think there's an important S there is not we the people but we the peoples now I think often often in these rooms it sometimes feels more like we the states uh, but the one meeting where it cannot be mistaken actually that UN is about peoples this is about the permanent uh, forum that the UN is not only by the people but for the people and, and I think the permanent forum sends that message loud and clear, and it does so every year. And therefore, I have to say that as UN diplomats, this is always a meeting we look forward to because it reminds us very, very, in very concrete terms that this is about people. And then I just have to say it's truly great to be able to meet in person. It's been a long time uh, coming and to see so many different indigenous peoples uh, and organizations present at the at the headquarters for the UN here in New York, including my friend from Toraja in Indonesia. Then I have to say, as, as a Dane, say they're very, very happy that the Kingdom of Denmark this year is represented both by colleagues from Denmark, but also from Greenland as this year's uh, forum. The permanent forum holds a very special place for the Kingdom of Denmark because it provides, in many ways, a unique platform for the indigenous peoples of the world to come together to exchange experiences but also discuss progress and, let's be honest, challenges, but also to be seen and to be heard and speak truth to power. Now, turning to the launch of this year's Indigenous World Report, which is not a report, it's actually a handbook. Now, let's be honest, this is a handbook. This is a tool uh, which the government in Denmark is very, very proud to support. And we really appreciate the work that India is, is doing with the launch of this report now for the 37th Time, no? This is tenacity, no? this is perseverance, and this is sort of sticking to, to what you know works. Now, why is this publication so important? Well, in many ways, it serves the same purposes as the permanent forum, and let me share some of what I think we also said at the, 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 at the launch of last year's report, because it still holds true, and it bears uh, repeating. So first, like the permanent forum itself, this 
handbook is a gold mine of information. You want to know how rights of indigenous peoples are being progressed in Canada? Well, you can go find your Canadian Inuit colleagues in the permanent forum, or you can go to page 511. <laughs> uh, I recommend you do both, but first go to uh, page 511. You can also read about uh, a part of the Kingdom of Denmark and Greenland, and some of our sad, uh, sad, sad history, something that we're not particularly proud of in Denmark, but that needs to come out. You can learn about indigenous peoples and the SDGs, and so we can go on and on and on. This is really the goal. Second, like the permanent form, it gives a voice to indigenous people from all over the world who have contributed to the report. And this is about, in our view, about being seen and being heard, and the handbook, the report, does that in a very concrete way. <coughs> and third, like the permanent forum, it holds government <coughs> accountable. It simply has, and let's be honest, it simply has a disciplinary effect to be monitored, whether it's through interventions in the permanent forum or through a report like this, where you every move as a government is being recorded, being published, and being disseminated. And third, or fourth, it is like the current form, this report makes us wiser on an important theme every year. And it does so, and I think this is really important in, this, in these years with social media, with so much disinformation, it does so on the basis of solid <coughs> documentation and real life accounts and experiences from indigenous peoples and their communities. And finally, fifth, like the permanent forum, this report is global in scope and therefore has the ability to capture more systemic and cross-border or border crossing trends and issues that we sometimes tend to overlook when we are not presented with aggregated knowledge like this. So compiling this in, in one report, in a handbook, is actually really useful. And I have to say that for us, both the government of Denmark, but also for us diplomats at the Permanent Mission of Denmark, the outcome of the Permanent Forum <coughs> or this handbook is something that we do not share. No? We use this in our work, not only during the Permanent Forum, but in our everyday, whether it's the Commission on the Status of Women or the Commission on Population and Development, we use this as a reference document. So in many ways, the knowledge that, that the report or handbook provides qualifies our work in the UN and it helps understand some of the themes and challenges that we need to bring forward in our discussions among states but with the UN system for civil society also. And it helps us in looking for relevant ways you might say to strengthen language in resolutions, both those regarding indigenous issues but also broader themes where we need to bring the challenges but also the specific perspectives of indigenous peoples to the, to the forefront. Now, we are making small and incremental steps here at the UN, and often it can seem like a tedious and slow <coughs> process, and that's not an inaccurate observation, but we do see progress. Uh, and this is just the way the UN works. Things take time, we take small steps, <coughs> but important steps. And let me just highlight the resolution on indigenous peoples that comes every year in the third committee. Now last year, we managed to further strengthen the language on the protection of indigenous human rights defenders condemning cases of reprisals of indigenous peoples, as well as securing language on responsible business activities on indigenous people's lands and territory. And we know this makes a real difference in real people's lives out there. This year in the Human Rights Council, Denmark presented a resolution on special rapporteur on torture and for the first time in the history of the mandate, indigenous peoples have been included as a separate group with which the special rapporteur was called. So for us, this is about voice and presence and making these small steps is important. Now, during the recent negotiations on the Convention on Biological Diversity at COP15, securing an agreement that respects and safeguards the rights of indigenous peoples was a key priority for the Kingdom of Denmark and we participated actively in the negotiations for the new implementing agreement under the UN Convention on Law of the Sea on Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, EBNJ as it's called among UN diplomats. And we had a core focus on the rights of indigenous peoples and the use of traditional knowledge with the free, prior, and informed consent of knowledge holders. And we are very, very pleased to see
see that the efforts of all of us, along with so many other delegations, bore fruit, and that there is a strong text on this in the final uh, agreement. And just last month, the Kingdom of Denmark successfully worked to include strong language on indigenous women and girls' participation in the areas of innovation and technological change and digital access in the agreed conclusions of this year's Commission on the Status of Women. So it's hard, it takes time, but it actually works. We are moving, taking those small steps, but we genuinely believe that all these small steps contribute to a greater awareness and consideration of indigenous issues at the most natural level. And we think this is important not just for indigenous peoples, but it's important for all of us, because there is much to learn. But to do this effectively, we need the qualified input and the knowledge of the rich civil society working on these issues. So thank you, thank you to IDEA, and thank you to all of you that have contributed to this. It makes a real difference in our lives. Now finally, I just want to, if I may, a word on the theme of this year's report, which really is, I think, a testament to the intertwined nature of the issues that indigenous people face. Now, indigenous people's knowledge, land tenure systems, and sustainable management of resources play a key role in managing the risks and impacts of climate change, of protecting biodiversity, and achieving sustainable development. And in many ways, it is a sad paradox that indigenous peoples are being displaced from their territories in the very name of conservation and protection of nature. And we are deeply concerned about the alarming violations of the rights of indigenous peoples in protected nature areas where what you might call sort of an exclusionary approach to protecting biodiversity not only risks worsening our planetary crisis, but also has led to forced evictions, violence, and killings of indigenous human rights defenders. Now let me be clear, and we are not afraid to say this also in the conference rooms outside of this one that all states have a responsibility to respect human rights, including indigenous people's rights. The rights of indigenous peoples must be respected and applied <coughs> in the context also of conservation and protected areas. And you can count on Denmark to make this clear whenever we have a chance. Indigenous peoples must be recognized not only as stakeholders, as partners, sort of two classical buzzwords here at the UN, but actually <coughs> also as rights holders, you hold rights in conservation efforts undertaken in their lands and territories and in decisions, of course, affecting their rights, lands, resources, livelihoods, and food security. Now, in our view, if we fail to respect, protect, and promote the rights of indigenous people, we not only fail in protecting human rights for all, and if human rights are not for all, then they are really for all, no? But we also fail and I think this is particularly important, we also fail in our efforts to secure the health of our planet. So thank you again, Ikea, thank you to everyone for making indigenous people's rights in conservation areas the theme of this year's report. This handbook and the knowledge you provide us with, as I said, is crucial and will continue to be in the years to come. So while we are going to be using the 37th edition of this, we look forward to the 38th next year and the 39th, and hope that you will continue to provide us with the knowledge, the insight, and the understanding which is so needed to you now. So thank you so much for everything that you do, and thank you for having me. support of them, uh, it would be very difficult for us to, so I just want to say, and I could say a lot of things, but we have Darío Mejía Montalvo here who also has to leave, so Martin, always a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. Darío, for the Muchas gracias, Lola, muchas gracias a todos, muchas gracias. Señor Ministro, por, ah, no sé si le estoy cambiando el título, <risas> discúlpenme, eh, por eh, esta oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes en esta tarde tranquila después de esta jornada. 
Um, yo, yo quiero hacer unos comentarios eh, improvisados sobre esta publicación y, y quiero compartir con ustedes eh, una historia. Eh, yo creo que en parte este texto es responsable de que esté yo aquí con ustedes en, en esta tarde porque yo vengo de una familia en, en mi territorio eh, que fue heredera eh, de alguna manera de procesos de esclavización. Eh, mis, mis, mis padres eh, no tenían eh, forma de vivir eh, económicamente y entrar al movimiento indígena eh, de, de mi papá en lo que se conoció como la recuperación de las tierras la recuperación de las tierras, de los resguardos. Yo era muy inquieto de niño. Yo le preguntaba ahora, ¿cuántos años es que tiene este texto? Porque entonces empiezo a entender por qué llegó a la mochila de mi papá en ese tiempo. Por qué llegó eh, este texto. Por qué mi papá, que era analfabeta, andaba con dos textos, uno gordo y uno flaco, en su mochila. El, el, el gordito era este en español y el flaquito una cartilla se llamaba eh, unidad indígena no le estoy haciendo publicidad gratis a, a la otra publicación pero fue lo que encontré un día que me puse a, dice uno curucutear es una palabra rebuscar de atrevido en, la, en las cosas que tenía mi papá en, entre sus saco que andaba en el burro eh, yendo a las recuperaciones de las tierras y encontré este texto en algún lado tengo que reconocer que no sabía yo leer muy bien entonces todavía y puedo decir ahora con, con un poco la secuencia de palabras que para mí significa esta publicación eh, porque luego fue llegando y no fue solo uno luego llegaba otra vez es porque uno de mis hermanos era dirigente indígena en Colombia y era directivo de la Organización Nacional Indígena de Colombia, a la que después llegué. Y en esa, esa, él llegaba al territorio y llevaba la publicación. Y lo que yo puedo decir es que lo primero que a uno le genera este texto cuando lo ve es que le permite abrir los ojos le permite abrir los ojos porque uno cuando está en el territorio, en la niñez, en la juventud, no logra dimensionar lo que hay más allá del patio de sus vecinos. Es, es lo que uno conoce, uno, pero cuando uno logra y ve al menos las fotografías, lo que uno no lee, sino que uno ve las fotografías, dice esa gente tan rara, esa gente tan... ¿de dónde serán? Empieza uno a abrir los ojos, empieza a a, a cuestionarse y, y, no, y esa gente que vive tan lejos, ¿por qué vive así? Empieza uno de niño a generarse las, las preguntas. Y lo siguiente que hace el libro en la vida de los indígenas inquietos y traviesos es que le levanta la mirada. Le levanta la mirada más allá de sus fronteras y empieza a comparar su historia con las historias de otros. Cuando ya uno aprende a leer pasa de ver las fotografías a leer un poco el texto y empieza a aprender un poco más. Y ese fue mi otro encuentro con este texto, ya cuando empecé a, la, a llegar a los procesos organizativos en la juventud. Ya no llegaba con el otro libro flash, ya llegaba solito o con otra revista. Eh, y luego... Este libro también le permite a uno despertar algo que es fundamental, yo digo, en todo proceso, que es generar una capacidad de sorpresa. Yo creo que si nosotros los seres humanos, los, los, los que estamos en los procesos organizativos, no tenemos capacidad para sorprendernos, es muy difícil que luego nos movilicemos. Y este libro genera esto, uno logra sorprenderse. Sorprenderse por las cosas negativas, por las cosas tristes, por las cosas duras que en la madurez del crecimiento uno ya va generando, pero también 
sorprenderse por la capacidad humana, por la capacidad de lucha, por la capacidad, el esfuerzo que significa que otros grupos, otros pueblos en todo el mundo, pero también sorprenderse por la inmensa eh, diversidad y la igualdad que hay entre los procesos. Eh, hoy día yo creo que por mucho esfuerzo que haga la tecnología con los smartphones, eh, de tratar de que uno vea el mundo a través del celular, todavía para los pueblos indígenas el mundo se puede leer a través de este texto. El mundo indígena sigue siendo lo que hoy día intenta hacer la tecnología con los smartphones. Entonces yo quiero, con estas palabras, decir que lo, la última cosa que genera este texto en el proceso organizativo de los pueblos indígenas es que siempre hace un llamado a la unidad. Siempre, siempre todos los textos uno va y encuentra. No, no voy a confesar que me los he leído todos, no. Pero siempre en las ediciones, siempre uno encuentra que hay un llamado, los mensajes en es a estar unidos a la unidad. Yo con esto quiero eh, simplemente agradecerles a ustedes por todo el trabajo de estos 37 años, por todas las ediciones, por todas estas aportes que le hacen a los procesos organizativos, a los sistemas educativos propios, porque esto es lo que educa en gran parte lo que no educan los establecimientos oficiales la gente lo aprende a través de este tipo de publicaciones y es lo que permite generar capacidades colectivas a todos y a todas. Entonces, por eso yo digo que uno aprendió a leer, aprendió a, so a levantar la mirada, aprendió a sorprenderse y eso lo lleva por un camino que de alguna manera lo trae a cumplir una de las tareas que uno nunca imaginó, que fue estar en una presentación de este texto. Por eso, muchas gracias, muy amable. por la reelección como presidente del foro permanente. Desde aquí te, te deseamos. Sí. Cuentas con todo nuestro apoyo. Y gracias porque sé que estás tienes otras obligaciones. Muchísimas gracias, Darío. And uh, I think it was very good that uh, the complementarity between what Martin said about how the states can use the book, but also how indigenous people can use the book. And this is what this book intends. It intends to be a resource uh, tool for indigenous peoples, first of all, to use it in the struggle for the recognition and the protection of their rights, but also, of course, states, UN organizations, and other relevant this stakeholders. Is, this is 37, 37 edition. edition, but Meaning, 80, the first one I think it was 86. <laughs> okay. But now I'm very pleased to have here with us at Francisco Calizai. I don't think I need to make a long presentation He is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples since 2018, <coughs> and a person who has been involved in the indigenous movement uh, for many, many years, being the first indigenous uh, person expert who was a member of one of the treaty bodies, the Committee Against Racial Discrimination, even who was during four years the president. No, two years. Okay. Sorry. But Francisco, it's always a pleasure to work with you and to help or support your mandate as much as we can. So the floor is yours to see some kind of remarks about the indigenous work. Bueno, voy a aprovechar de que escuché la muy buena traducción de los amigos y amigas traductoras. Eh, voy a utilizar otro idioma colonizador el español. Eh, quiero hacer mía las palabras del señor embajador. Han sido palabras que reflejan realmente lo que es el mundo indígena. 
eh, igual que Darío, eh, conocí el mundo indígena como un, un libro, no solamente un, un informe, sino un libro de referencia. Y conozco a Isquía hace cuánto, Lola, 31 años. Eh, la primera vez que estuve en Dinamarca, en Copenhague, visité las oficinas de, de Isquía. Y lo primero que me impresionó fue la cantidad de, de, de mundo indígena que ya habían sido publicados. Desde aquel entonces eh, he tenido el privilegio de tener una copia cada año, ya sea en, en bruto, como decimos, o en, ¿cómo se llama? O en o electrónicamente. Eh, ¿Qué puedo decir yo de este número? Es un número que viene a reflejar bastante el trabajo eh, realizado por esta, re esta relatoría del año pasado, con el informe de áreas protegidas, eh, el trabajo eh, que realizan las hermanas indígenas en la conservación, no solo de, de, de los conocimientos científicos, sino que es, que esencialmente en lo que se refiere a la diversidad biológica. Ejemplos de cuál es el trabajo de las mujeres indígenas sobran, pero que no son muy conocidos y ese fue el esfuerzo que yo traté de hacer el año pasado de dar a conocer el papel protagónico e histórico que juegan las mujeres en el rescate, el fortalecimiento de los conocimientos científicos de los pueblos indígenas. Esencialmente en lo que nos refiere a las áreas protegidas, a la diversidad biológica. Y por supuesto es un material que me va a servir bastante para mis próximos dos informes que presentaré este año y es esencialmente sobre el financiamiento verde eh, y las consecuencias en los pueblos indígenas y por supuesto el informe sobre la actividad turística y los efectos en los pueblos indígenas. Este libro es un libro de referencia bastante grande y Creo de que cualquier organización que quiera tener algún elemento de referencia y de mayor conocimiento sobre la situación de los pueblos indígenas en el mundo, tiene que cargar un mundo indígena, entre el, como decimos nosotros, en el morral, decimos nosotros en Guatemala, en la mochila, diríamos en, otro, en otros tiempos, en la bolsa, en cualquier otro lugar, pero debe de ser un libro de referencia para conocer los derechos de los pueblos indígenas y el papel esencial que han jugado los pueblos indígenas, pero principalmente los, perdón, las mujeres, las y los jóvenes indígenas en el mundo. ¿Y qué más puedo decir de esto? Hace 31 años que vengo recorriendo el camino conjuntamente con, con Lola, con Izquía, Catherine, con Alejandro por mencionar algunos de los nombres que me acuerdo ahorita en este momento, porque hay personas que han estado trabajando que no se conocen, pero que han estado trabajando muy, muy de cerca y muy duro eh, con Izquía. El mundo indígena que, que tenemos el día de hoy refleja realmente el trabajo de la defensa de los territorios, de las tierras, de los recursos naturales pero también refleja la cruda realidad de los defensores de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas, que en un momento determinado no se creía que fueran defensores de derechos humanos. Y yo creo que en el día de hoy hablar de derechos de pueblos indígenas es claro que estamos hablando de derechos humanos. Todavía en los años 80 los derechos humanos no pasaban por los pueblos indígenas. Ha sido el día de hoy un reflejo de más de 30 años de lucha y lo que se tiene el día de hoy no es una ganancia eh, sencilla, no es un regalo de los estados, es el resultado de la lucha ardua de los pueblos indígenas, de los representantes, la representante de los pueblos indígenas. Eh, yo sé que a Tarsila no mucho le gusta que diga cuando nos conocimos, pero ella siempre me dice era cuando éramos jóvenes y bellos. Y yo le digo, no, somos jóvenes y somos bellos todavía. Por supuesto, con una juventud acumulada. 
Entonces, es una cuestión que debemos de ir teniendo esa, esa esperanza de que algún día vamos a ver a los pueblos indígenas eh, libres de cualquier tipo de opresión, libres de cualquier tipo de racismo y de discriminación racial. Y algún día, no solo la relatoría que sea ocupada por una o un indígena, que también los mecanismos especializados, los mecanismos eh, de organismos de, de tratados, también hayan indígenas, miembros y miembros de estos órganos de tratados. En este momento no hay ninguno, no hay ninguna. Es necesario que tomemos conciencia de que hay necesidad de que la lucha no se hace solamente en el foro, no solamente se hace en el mecanismo de expertos, se hace también en los órganos de tratados. En la los, por eso, en la CEDAW, es un órgano de tratado. Entonces, por eso, las y los invito a que sean parte de esos órganos de tratados. Porque habemos y hay gente preparada para ocupar esos puestos. Muchísimas gracias y como decimos en, en Cachiquel, Hanel Animatiosí, Chivey, bueno, que... Francisco, que gracias por las palabras un poco que reafirman un poco el, 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 este libro al mundo indígena como un instrumento, un instrumento al final de lucha y reivindicación. Para nosotros esa, ese componente es especialmente importante porque los, el primer objetivo para nosotros es que sea un instrumento para los propios pueblos indígenas. Y en relación con Creo que si miramos los 37 años, las 37 ediciones, es un instrumento de monitoreo. Es un instrumento de monitoreo. Puedes ir viendo el desarrollo. Uh, lamentablemente se ve también la falta de avances y muchos de los problemas que veíamos hace 37 años se siguen viendo en la actualidad. Pero también se pueden ver los desarrollos. Lo has mencionado, la necesidad de incidir entre los pueblos, entre los representantes indígenas, expertos indígenas, todavía tengan una mayor visibilidad y una mayor participación en otros mecanismos de las Naciones Unidas como los mecanismos de los Gracias, Francisco, y un placer y un honor haber trabajado contigo durante tantos años y seguir Y ahora quiero dar la. Can I just say, I, I have to leave. I, I, I will literally put the indigenous world in, in my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> and then just, just to encourage you to, uh, to keep holding us to our promises and to our commitments. And just keep, keep fighting the fight. It matters not only during the next two weeks of the permanent forum, but, uh, but, but throughout the year. Uh, because. Uh, Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. <laughs> But now I, I have the pleasure to... Yeah, I have the pleasure to give the floor to Catherine Messenger the IKEA's executive director. And Catherine will, as I said in the beginning, she will go more into some kind of highlights about the book, about the content of the book, and also about how this book is prepared. Catherine, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lola. And it's, it's so nice to see all of you here after a very long first day at the UN Permanent Forum that you still have the energy to join us here. And it's really great to do this book launch in person again. I've been uh, in a couple of book launches of the indigenous world for many years ago. And uh, over the last years, we had to do it uh, virtually. So it's really, really nice to be able to, to be here again and to have carried a lot of books here. Um, yeah. <laughs> as many of you know, and as we have heard before, this book has been uh, published since 1986. Uh, so this is the 37th uh, edition of it, and this year's edition includes 56 regional reports and 17 reports on international processes and initiatives. And it really, this, this overview really serves to document what has happened during the last year, the developments that indigenous peoples have experienced over the last year. 
Um, and we wouldn't be able to actually produce this book if we didn't have so many fantastic contributions. Um, there are almost 120 authors that have written for the indigenous world this year. Um, and these are our network, indigenous uh, people, um, experts, uh, activists, and so on and so forth. And without their contribution, we wouldn't be able to do this. So this is a really great thank you to all of you who have contributed. Many of you sit in this room. Some of you sit on this panel. It's really, really, we're very thankful. And also a uh, great thanks to, of course, the PR staff that every year invests a lot of uh, time on this as well. And so doing this and investing so much time is also really rewarding to hear these stories from Daria, from Francisco, about the usefulness uh, of this book. Um, and it really gives us um, the, you know, the, the, the courage and, and the energy to, to continue doing this documentation, which we find is, is really a part, very important part of our work. I must say that uh, Francisco just mentioned that uh, there has been a fight for 30 years and a lot has been achieved. And somehow that's also reflected in the book because when you look at the book from 37 years ago, it was quite thin and it has become more and more heavy over the last Every year. years. And I don't know, you don't know how have to carry it around all the time. You can also put it into a shelf and tie it out when you need it. It's become quite heavy. Um, so, as I said, the documentation of the situation of indigenous peoples around the world is really one of uh, the major activities of UPIA, uh, one of our, I would say, um, core um, activities. And, uh, and so this is the, the major product of that. We have decided at some point that we want to have a specific theme every year that we give a little bit more attention to. Last year it was on indigenous women. This year it is on conservation. Um, and so this book includes a number of articles um, that is uh, looking at this issue, like for example, a little bit later we will hear Georgie tell us about the article on the CBD process, the Communing Montreal uh, Global Biodiversity Framework as well. It also includes an article on the Africa Protected Areas Congress that took place in 2022. Um, so there are some international processes around conservation that are covered in the book. Um, and then we also have, of course, the country articles that are telling about some of the developments in the countries. There are some positive developments um, on the creation of co-management systems with indigenous peoples. But what is most important is the effort indigenous peoples actually do themselves to conserve the lands, their territories, in a self-determined, with their self-determined governance. <coughs> I think that is one of the major elements. Unfortunately, I also must say that there are more negative examples of how conservation impacts on indigenous peoples and violates their human rights, um, including uh, resulting in evictions. And I think that uh, the report by the UN Special Rapporteur by Francisco last year also really well documents that and of course, there is also an article on that report in this issue. <coughs> um, beyond conservation, the indigenous world also gives a wider update on things that have happened during the past year. There is, for example, an article on the set of uh, special rec recommendation that we have heard about uh, today. Um, and of course, as I said before, there are country updates. I think that one of the things that I want to particularly mention is that we are not always able to include all countries where indigenous peoples live in this book. But just because a country is not included, that does not mean that the situation of indigenous peoples in that country doesn't need attention. It is very often actually countries where the situation is particularly precarious that we cannot find authors because it's difficult to write or it can be even dangerous to write. And so I want to also say that one of the most um, encouraging things, I think, for me in this book is also to read every year about the continued struggle, how indigenous people insist and keep insisting on their rights. And to read about the courage and the effort, the movement, the, 
the standing together to fight for their rights is described in this book, despite the difficult circumstances that many indigenous peoples face. And so I really, really hope that this book is of use for indigenous peoples, that we as IKEA can contribute to that struggle and that we can provide something to, to you to, to, to struggle and to continue that. Um, I think that the ambassador has, has said it very uh, well that this is, uh, that he thinks that this is uh, contributing for indigenous, to indigenous being, peoples being heard and seen. And I really hope that we can contribute to that. And of course, I would really like to thank our donors again that have contributed to our work and especially to this book. Now, the ambassador is not here anymore, but uh, Danita Denmark is really a great contributor, and other donors are, of course, also really uh, great contributors to our work. And with this, I would like to again thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Catherine, for giving this quite clear overview about what is the year book, what is our objective. And going back also with the ambassador, what comparing the book to the common forum, that year is not here, but I think uh, what we want is that this book is a good tool also for the common forum. So it's not to to compete <laughs> with the permanent forum in any way, but we really hope that the information, the documentation could use is useful <coughs> for the permanent forum and for the UN mechanism, like the UN Special Rapporteur, or the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, and even for the treaty bodies, that we send also some information on our thoughts to the treaty bodies. So thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, now I have the pleasure to invite Jyoti Karini to, and Jyoti is the Senior Policy Advisor at the Forest Peoples Program from Venner of the Indigenous Navigator Consortium, uh, but also uh, I think he's a co-chair of the uh, working group. Um, <coughs> I, I didn't remember exactly the, the title, <laughs> but Jyoti uh, is a, uh, has been an indigenous activist for many, many years. I also have known Georgie for almost more than 30 years. I think the first uh, Asian to attend the first Asian to attend the working group on indigenous populations in Geneva. So he has a long life uh, career on struggling for the rights of indigenous people. And uh, Georgie, the floor is yours, what I want, and then first of all, also thank you very much for your contribution to the indigenous world. And uh, we would like to hear if you can give some highlights, and they are reflected in her article, if somebody wants to know more. But what has been achieved by indigenous peoples in the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity? Um, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Lola, for that uh, very kind introduction. I'm actually especially happy that you introduced me as an activist. Because in my own mind, uh, I see myself as an activist for indigenous people's rights. And uh, one of the more recent uh, political arenas where I have put a lot of effort and attention has been the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, you may have heard already from uh, the presentations in the um, permanent forum uh, meeting about uh, what, has, what was achieved at uh, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, I'll just very briefly say um, what was achieved particularly in relation to indigenous people's rights. So the human rights-based approach was uh, adopted to guide the implementation of the framework. And in particular, in some of these goals, were the following rights. The rights, of, uh, the rights to lands, territories, and resources in targets 1, 3, and 22. Protection and promotion of customary sustainable use in targets 5 and 9. Free prior informed consent in general 
but also in relation to access and benefit sharing and the use of traditional <coughs> knowledge, equitable governance and full and effective participation in target 22, access to justice and protection of environmental human rights defenders, and also the rights of women and girls in the context of gender equity. So those are very specific um, texts on human rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. Now that remains an issue as to the coverage of the convention, which indeed is of indigenous peoples and local communities. There has been reference to the, uh, our yearbook being akin to the permanent forum, and indeed it has become a permanent fixture in terms of indigenous people's rights. I'd like to venture an opinion here, which is that we have really made a landmark um, breakthrough in international environmental law, that the rights of indigenous peoples are now put in the center of the implementation of the biodiversity strategy. And another struggle that is presently taking place that will be decided at the next COP is the decision on the future institutional arrangements and the program of work on uh, traditional knowledge and other provisions of the convention. I think we are on the brink of getting a permanent body. We're asking for a permanent subsidiary body that we look at all of these goals and targets that are now put in the Kunming uh, Montreal uh, Global GBF. And this is a body where in indigenous peoples are given equal uh, status of our knowledge, our contributions, and our advice to the conference of parties. And hopefully this will have a big impact in uh, guidance towards national implementation when our governments will be adopting their national uh, strategies. This will be the next uh, struggle that we have gotten this nice text, but how this will be implemented is the next battle, and we need mechanisms and programs of work that will give enough detail and guidance for that. So, um, Whilst uh, there are differences of opinion about the coverage of the CDB, indigenous peoples and local communities, we can address that issue, but uh, the rights of indigenous peoples are well recognized and also the traditional knowledge of uh, local communities. Where some governments who are still uh, backward in the recognition of indigenous peoples in their countries are nonetheless prepared to advance our contributions, our rights, and our knowledge in the national implementation of biodiversity. And for me, coming from Asia, this is a use, and also our colleagues from Africa, that was a useful advance from our governments, although we still need to push them for the full recognition of indigenous people's rights. I hope uh, everybody will now use the uh, great uh, yearbook that uh, IGEA produces all the time to really understand the detail of what was achieved because now we are entering into a battle of interpretation. <laughs> there are those who want to minimize what was achieved and those who are very aware that there are still many imperfections or gaps in what was achieved in the CBD. But the active transformative agents are ourselves as activists, as uh, the change makers, and any success in the CBD is really up to us to make use of what is available uh, globally in the standards, but what we can actually do on the ground. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shirley, for sharing with us this brief information about the achievement and indeed it, one of the biggest developments that are reflected in the book uh, that has happened this year. And uh, just taking your taking you words, Georgie, 
I would say that uh, now start the battle of interpretation, but also the battle of differentiation. And uh, so uh, I think there is where the unity of indigenous peoples is most important to, to reach that. So thank you very much, and thank you very much again. So now I have the pleasure to introduce in fact somebody from Indonesia. And Ruka is the first female Secretary General of the world's largest indigenous organization, the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of the Archipelago, Aman, in Indonesia. So Ruka, I would like you to share with us what are the challenges and opportunities of conservation actions or initiatives for indigenous peoples in Indonesia? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Um, I belong to indigenous peoples in our history, as far as we remember, we never, in the situations of defeat, we were known, our ancestors were very well known of defending our indigenous territories from anyone. So we don't have that reality, we, we still cannot comprehend the reality of losing our ancestral lands. And just last, just last, uh, last month, we had a meeting, and my brother was like, no, impossible. How can we lose our ancestral land? It was very true, because that's as a Toraja, it's never in our reality. And that's also, it was me, more than 30 years ago, in 1999, when I started to uh, join Aman, my organization. My parents, my mother and my father, who were the founders of the organization, one of the founders, told me that, uh, I asked them, what is indigenous peoples? In Indonesia, we call them masyarakat adat. And my ma my, they, were, they told me, you know, it's like us. And now I thought it was beautiful. I said, okay. Uh, so I left the opportunity because I was already accepted uh, uh, by one of the automobile companies, one of the biggest one in Indonesia. I left and I said, okay, I'll join this beautiful work. I was wrong. And the very first, I call it baptism by fire, was the eviction of indigenous peoples in national park. Just the neighbor to my community. And it was also one of the cases where I started to bring indigenous peoples case into the international level. And it was through our friends Ibgia and the APP in Urban the World Park Congress. Um, and one of the, in 1990, in, 1990, in 2013, 2012, we challenged our national law on forests at the national uh, court, on constitutional court. And one of our indigenous leaders told me that they, the testimony, he was saying that the history of how they lose their land, first, it, because it was claimed by Indonesian as forest areas. And then they gave it to uh, mining, first to lodging company. And then the second, they gave it to mining and then the rest they give it also to uh, plantations but then in 2000 
2010, uh, one of the conservation group came and they say, oh, we still have some of the forest left. Uh, it will be protected because it is what they call high conservation type forest. And they were not allowed to get into that forest again. So they were left with nothing, even for what so-called high conservation value forest. And you know who, uh, who is the promoter on that, right? I don't have to mention their name. And going on and on, we won the case at the Constitutional Court that practically recognized our rights to our land territories and resources, including our forests, including all the, all the different ecosystems that we've been protected. But then, until today, it's only out of 26 million hectares that we have mapped and we have submitted to the government, it's only 150,000 hectares that have been returned to us. They even chopped out our territory because they say it is within the national parks or conser conservation area. They didn't want to return to us. And they use the tweak, and they use the term, they call it Kemitra and Conservasi, Conservations Partnership, to avoid giving back our land. And we suffer a lot, our leaders even being killed in the past. And in 2015 to 2016, the National Commission on Human Rights conducted a very detailed <coughs> investigations on the human rights violations of indigenous peoples within the context of claim over forest land but nothing has happened. And today, we are even, again, there are opportunity, there's opportunity because the global community have agreed and have accepted that indigenous peoples and local communities are we are providing solutions to the crisis that we are, we, we, are, we are having now. But at the same time, again, they are going to use that narrative to take over our land. Because first they will use it again for conservations without recognizing our rights as indigenous peoples. And the second ones, they will say, oh, we need to uh, have more, uh, we need to rehabilitate, we need to restore, we need to, uh, of, of forest and now uh, we've seen in our territory and I think Francesco is he here or he left, he left already. One of our islands in Southeast Maluku where actually we managed to get the government to revoke the permit there to cut the forest. They managed to they they, they did cut a lot because of the CERT, and thanks to Francesco. He was at the uh, CERT committee back then when we filed the complaint. And then we used that to keep away that uh, company. So then the, the, the minister report that permit from that company. But now, the same company is getting new, new uh, license permit. And it is for, it's what's so called for project, a carbon project. And then, with all this policy coming in, it was under the promise of what so-called job opportunities. It's, they, they call it omnibus law on job creations. And the second one is, again, the according to our president, a decree, it says that carbon rights belong to the state. So even though forests forest belong to us, we are the one who take care of the core forest for centuries while they are cutting down all the forests. Uh, still, the thing that we take care still don't belong to us, belong to them. And then now, they even make it worse because the new conservation bill 
is that the parliament is ready to be adopted again. And there's nothing about individual rights on that one. So I think we need to we need to understand that sometimes the beautiful things that is agreed that is that we think it's beautiful already at global level. It's not the reality at national uh, level. It's not the reality of indigenous people, because when, even if we say, okay, the future is in indigenous and local communities, but still, who will who will uh, take the credit in the end? It's the government and it's the conservation uh, organizations. And I think, and I think. We need to we need to aware on this that this opportunity <coughs> that we have today, we are not losing it. And I think that's what you say miss implementation. There's a problem when it comes to implementation because at national at global level we say all these beautiful <coughs> things, but when it comes down we see all the crooks and you know people's like chopping off and trying to divert everything. And I think we as indigenous peoples, our what we have to do now is not just united, but we need to talk with others, with non-indigenous peoples, because they are the ones actually who made us like this. Yeah, so this kind of conversation, I think we need to bring it out to the public outside of us. So we don't just talk among ourselves. Because when we talk, when we say, okay, hi sister, how are you? Do uh, you need my help? We can, you know, we always came in like immediately, you know. But how about others? How about the uh, citizens in the in the global north? Yeah. How about because they are the one. They 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 they, they, they suffer, but the suffering is the source of our suffering. And I think we need to communicate that to them because in the end of the day, what we are doing today as indigenous peoples, it is not just. We are not just protecting our uh, territory, we are not just protecting our biodiversity, we are not just protecting our, the Mother Earth, but we are protecting all human beings. And that's why it is not fair if all of the, the uh, responsibility is really put on the indigenous peoples, no way. It has to be on all human beings. That's too much for us. We are not being recognized. We are criminalized for protecting the Mother Earth. And now suddenly say, okay, you do all the work and I will continue to, 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 to kill the Mother Earth. So I think that's, that's uh, fairly, uh, that's one of the things like, you know, communication. Because I believe if we only talk with our government, they won't listen. If we only talk with business sectors, they won't listen. But we need to talk with the citizens in the global north. And like now, they don't understand that even if they buy, if they are buying the call it what they call electric car, they're very proud of that, of the of their electric cars in in the U.S. here. But they don't understand that actually, that also killing us even much more today. You know, so I think that I think we need to expose them with this information because they are the one that can also take action on their behalf. And not just us, to be us, to take action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruka, for sharing the highlights from the struggle of the people to maintain and defend their territory. And this is the case that is reflected in the book that many people, many indigenous peoples in the world are doing the struggle is to protect their territories. The other issue, I think it's very important among the many things also that you say is uh, how to bring these beautiful agreements and words from the international level to make a difference on the ground. If they don't make any difference on the ground, they are worth it. So that, that is, is, is very important. And it has been called many things like the implementation gap and many things, but we need to be clear that the struggle is to get these agreements implemented. Yeah. 
and uh, call for the accountability of states and other stakeholders to what it has been agreed. And of course, the issue of talking to others, I think is important, uh, establishing alliances and talking to the, as you said, the citizens of the global north, so they are aware of what their binds or their way of life cost to other people. But uh, of course, the book also intends to provide this information and make other people who does not know about what is the impact of those issues on indigenous people uh, to read it, to know it. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Luca. Uh, I also have the pleasure to give the floor to our last speaker, Edward Poroka. Edward Poroka is an indigenous lawyer and currently the executive director of Pastoralist Indigenous NGO Forum, Pingos Forum, which is an umbrella organization for pastoralists and hunter gatherers in Tanzania. He has also a very long life experience of the more, 20, more than 20 years of working with indigenous people's organizations in the areas of human rights, advocacy, policy analysis, constitutional issues, and climate change. So, Edward, thank you very much for being with us today. And thank you very much also for being one of the authors of one of the contributions about Tanzania in our book. Um, conservation initiatives have had disastrous consequences for indigenous peoples in Africa. Can you shortly share with us what are the challenges that you see also in the opportunity, of course, that indigenous peoples are facing in Tanzania with regard to conservation initiatives? Please. Thank you very much, Lola. Uh, it is a pleasure to physically attend to the, uh, <coughs> the launching of the book. For the first time, although I've been writing the articles for more than 10 years consecutively. And um, before I go into that, I think it is very important for me that Every year, at the end of the year, close to Christmas, this is my final work, writing an article on the uh, indigenous world, which provides uh, a really good reflection of what has been happening in my community for the full year. So it is really, the yearbook is really a summary of what has been happening in my community every year. It gives me an opportunity to really reflect, to really ref uh, uh, prioritize the challenges, prioritize the issues that have happened, and of course, reflecting and summarizing on all those issues. Um, with regards to the questions that you have just asked on the uh, conservation uh, challenges in my community, uh, the Maasai community, particularly in Tanzania, and probably in my neighbor country, Kenya, 90%, um, no, 70 to 75% of the challenges that we are facing are either related to conservation or drought. Those are the biggest problems that uh, indigenous people have. And even drought is really exacerbated by uh, increased conservation practices which are not friendly to indigenous people. For the indigenous people of Tanzania, uh, once you come into the Maasai land and then you want to develop a project on conservation, you will receive a very big resistance. And you might think indigenous people don't like conservation. And in fact, it is how conservation is conducted that make people hate conservation. Because it is through conservation that Tanzania is now having more than 40% of its landmass as protected areas and conservation areas. Most of which 
or I can say all of it was once belonging to indigenous people. We lost all the land to conservation. We have serious violation of human rights because of conservation. We are being evicted because of conservation. In last year alone, from June, more than 140 <coughs> indigenous people were evicted in Gorongoro and Loyondo. And serious violations, including uh, killing of indigenous people, loss of land, loss of livestock, which we depend on, is taken away because of the conservation practices that are taking place. I don't know whether it is happening in other parts of the world, but that is the situation in my country. Um, as we speak, many of the Maasai people are living in hunger because they lost their pasture last year, they lost their livestock last year, and still the government is taking the land for conservation. One other very serious issue with regard to conservation in my country and probably many of the other countries that it is not about conservation, it is about business. It is very unfortunate that the Global North believe that the governments are doing what they are doing because of conservation. They are not doing it for conservation, they are doing it for tourism, they are doing it for hunting, they are doing it for hotels. They are removing the people to get land for business. So we cannot differentiate in my country between business and conservation. Conservation has become a business. And it has become a way of evicting the people from their land. It is an agent for land grab. It is an agent for violation of human rights. And unfortunately, it is highly supported by the Western countries who provide the government with tools to do what they call conservation. To pay the game scouts, to buy uh, airplane and cars for monitoring the animal, to remove the people from their land, to ignore indigenous knowledge of conservation and separate <coughs> indigenous people from their beloved land. So that is what we are seeing in Tanzania. That is what we see as conservation. And what is termed conservation is in fact land grab in the name of conservation. And I think that is where now as indigenous people we need to come together and try to advocate for <coughs> friendly conservation that include us because like in a place where the indigenous people have been uh, evicted it is a world heritage site which is supported by UNESCO which is also supported by IUCN and other organizations but they are the same people that we meet here in the UN and talking about human rights but what we see is completely violation of the rights of indigenous people and we feel we need to have a beginning of a dialogue of talking about how do you, uh, how do we, what do we mean by conservation? We need to redefine conservation to separate conservation from the protest conservation, which uh, separate indigenous people from their nature, which support the loss of territories of indigenous people globally. Because that is the kind of conservation that is being supported by member states of the UN and which really is the cause of the suffering of indigenous people in many of their countries. That uh, I, I think many of you are tired of the I could talk until tomorrow, but uh, I think let me end. Thank you. and uh, conservation being a tool to grab indigenous 
land and territories for other proposals as businesses. That is a very important reality, a very sad reality that many indigenous peoples face uh, in many places in the world. And uh, also the accountability that we need to, to demand from UN institutions, uh, particularly in the context of World Heritage Sites and UNESCO. Also in many other cases, I think it's also important to demand the accountability of states and uh, international institutions and organizations when we talk about indigenous people's rights, and particularly the rights to land territories and resources. So with these words, I want to, to thank you again, our panelists, and uh, thank you, all of you, for joining us today. It's, it's, uh,